get into CoLab here, I'm going to say a few words about myself. I am a physics major, and I have been writing Python professionally for about a year. And before that, I've written Python for about eight years, doing stuff in the lab. And uh, yeah, my Python experience, it comes in the following form, I guess, data manipulation and visualization. Uh, experimental data collection, lab automation, and desktop GUIs for experiment design. Uh, and if you want to connect on LinkedIn or learn a little bit more about what I've done, uh, this is my page right here. So yes, uh, collab for collaboration. And I don't know if you read the Bay Piggies intro, but basically I'm going to be talking about how to quickly build useful Python tools using Google Colab. And I'm going to go through what is Colab, how to set up a project, uh, followed by a live example with some tips and tricks, and where you can go to find more tips and tricks. And if there is time and any interest, we're going to do maybe some Q and A. Okay, just moving right along. What is Colab? It's a it's a product from Google Research that is self-described as a hosted Jupyter notebook service that requires no setup to use while providing free access to computing resources, including GPUs. And specifically for the collaboration part of this talk, we're gonna talk about features such as seamless integration with Google Drive, seamless integration with GitHub, and a free cloud hosted Python runtime, which is what I think is one of the coolest things here. Yeah, let's, let's just get right into a little bit of a live example. You can get to Colab by going to colab.research.google.com or you can just Google search Colab and it's the first result. And it brings you to this little landing page and you can load a Colab here from Google Drive or GitHub. Uh, but everybody will get this little introduction, what is collaboratory. And so let's just take a quick look around here. This is a, uh, for those of you who are familiar with Jupyter, this is a, a Jupyter notebook hosted in the cloud. Um, the shortcuts and the power user features are gonna be a little different. And there's gonna be additional things that are, that Jupyter doesn't have. But in general, this is the, uh, this is the interface. And what I think is the most uh, important thing here, well, not the most important, but a very nice thing here, and one of the main points of the talk, is that we are connected to a Google virtual machine running Python for us. All I had to do is go to Colab, and here I have this, this live notebook, and you know, there's a table of contents here, there's some examples of things that you can do, or uh, useful things to get started with and clicking these opens up different notebooks and you can kind of explore around, you know, learn about TensorFlow, all this stuff. So yeah, that's, that's how you kind of get to Colab. Just go there. Now, how do we set up a shared Colab project slash environment? Now, this is kind of geared towards, say you want to do a small project for yourself or if you want to build a small useful tool for somebody, somebody else and I, that person doesn't need to know anything about how to install Python, how to do any environment setup, how to build things from the source, none of that. So here we go. Um, this is going to be kind of tricky. So first we create a new notebook. Go ahead. Before we yeah. start, is it okay to ask a question live or do you want to wait and hold questions until the end? Uh, go ahead. Yeah, shoot. Do you have access to the libraries included in Anaconda? You have access to, yes, you do. You have access to... Uh, let me get back to my collab here. Well, I guess most of them. And there is a live snippet section over here that is very useful. You click on this and it tells you how to install if there are no pack, if you want to use a package that isn't included out of the box, uh, right here. And then you click this nice little insert and it just inserts this cell for you. Uh, so yeah, really great built-in live documentation here. Uh, so yeah, moving, moving forward, uh, let's see here. Uh, yeah, oh, so here are the three, 
the three quick steps of setting up a collab project. I guess step two is optional, but, but highly recommended here. And uh, yeah, we click share. As this is a Google project or a Google product, sharing a notebook is very similar to sharing something like a Google Docs document or something in Google Slides. Uh, you just click the share link at the top and we'll, we'll look at that in the live example coming up here. So, okay, so you have a notebook set up and you want some external files. Maybe this is uh, a data file or maybe a settings file that you want accessible to everybody who is using this particular notebook. Uh, it's very simple. We, we mount Google Drive. Um, here's a snippet, two lines of code. Uh, similarly, you can go inside the Collab interface and click on this little folder button and then click on this folder button and it'll import this exact cell for you into the notebook. And likewise, you can click on th this to connect local files. Um, and this is all kind of in the documentation. But I'm going to move forward with just some, some more quick examples here. Uh, version control. Uh, Collab has a very nice built-in GitHub integration. It's as simple as clicking on a file, save a copy in GitHub. It'll give you a little pop-up to authenticate your GitHub account and uh, which repo, which branch you want this notebook to be saved to. So that's great. And the last thing for the live demo is how do you import your own modules into, you have this cloud hosted Python environment and you have some code in GitHub that you want to import. How do we do it? Uh, well, this is a Google virtual machine. So all we got to do here is clone uh, locally using uh, just the git command. We can write bash. Uh, this is an IPython notebook, so we can write bash with a little exclamation mark and we can just put this, this clone line. Uh, then we apply, add, sorry, we can add this to the path. And now I can import, and I'll show you this in the live example here. Um, I'm not going to click on this. This is a link to a GitHub gist that shows how to connect to specific branches in GitHub, and I'll be going through that in the live demo. Anyway. So uh, here we go. This is, a, this is a project that I started to kind of help a friend who's doing some research in a lab. And she, you know, with the COVID stuff happening, she got moved out of the lab. And she's trying to learn how to do some programming. And it's kind of, it's a lot. And so I've just built some small tools using Colab. Uh, so here's, here's the notebook. I'm on this, the Bay Piggies demo branch here. And when we open the notebook, uh, in GitHub, it's nicely rendered for us. And we have this beautiful, built-in link open in collab so this is super great uh, so yeah this is opening it's just going to take a second here we can see up here in the top right that it's automatically connecting us to a an instance of a google virtual machine and it gives us 12 gigs of ram and 100 gigs of storage out of the box we don't have to pay for that um, I'm going to scroll down here. Um, this blurb is just um, domain specific things that are relevant here. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we're cloning to a specific GitHub branch. And so I'm going to run this cell. And basically, this is a hybrid Python and Bash scripts that you can just put right here in this cell that basically says, okay, if there's a repo there, remove it download the latest repo, you know, switch to the branch that we're interested in. And there we go. And now that we have done that, I can import ocean and plotting. These are my specific libraries hosted on GitHub that I just pulled from my own GitHub repo up here, as well as the rest of the imports. So we're gonna run the imports and then we're going to use this connect Google Drive that I linked earlier. And I guess I'm already connected here, but if you're not connected, it'll give you a little pop-up that asks you to authenticate your Google account. And I just wanna pause and, and touch up on that real briefly. Uh, because it's your Google account, this notebook 
can only talk to your own Google Drive. And so for security reasons, if you're working with, for example, specific files that only need to be shared between a certain you know, small group of people, or maybe you and the person you're working with, uh, no one else can access those files because each instance is connected to your own Google account. I'm gonna import some data here. The code is, is not exciting. Uh, and then, okay, so I'm gonna show you uh, a couple small UIs. And this is a nice part of this talk, I think, because one of the goals here is building a small Python project for someone who doesn't uh, do a lot of programming or isn't comfortable working on the terminal and installing packages. Uh, so yeah, here's an example UI. I guess this one didn't, didn't render. Uh, that sometimes that happens. I'm just gonna run this one more time. It'll just be, it'll take about 15 seconds. Uh, and I guess while this is running, um, let me check the Q and A's here. Uh, I'll go ahead and read it to you just to make okay. it easier. That way you don't have to worry about it. So Jennifer's right. asking that she didn't quite catch your comment about storage space. It was kind of too fast. What about importing data from shared Google drives like team drives limited access to? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so I'm gonna scroll up here. And I have, uh, so in this import cell, we are, this actually is a path inside of my own Google Drive to a, a folder. And I have that pulled up up here. And it's a shared Google Drive folder. And this is holding all the data for this particular experiment, as well as some settings that I'm gonna be using with these UIs. And the only, people who can import this data are people who have shared access to this folder. So does, does that answer the question? Uh, I guess I don't know how to check. Oh, yeah, it, it did, keep going. Okay, okay, great. Don't worry, yeah, don't worry about trying to check the Q&A, we'll read it out to you so you can focus on the slides. There's a lot to okay. think about. Okay, great. Um, and no Jennifer problem. says, yes, that does, thanks, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So here, I'm not gonna talk really about the viz, but this is kind of a cleaned version of the viz that I prepared for this talk. I wanna focus in on these widgets down here. I wrote this entire thing using uh, IPy widgets. So this effectively is, is a 100% Python native web UI. No JavaScript, no HTML, and you can learn about this again with this code snippets over here on the right, widgets. And there is a source notebook for all pieces of the documentation that give you kind of a live working example of how to, I guess, do cool things. Uh, so this, my computer doesn't like having all of these things running at once. But for example, there are um, using, a, yeah, using widgets, there is examples of how to communicate between JavaScript running in the browser and Python, the Python kernel running on the Google virtual machine. So you can do pretty fancy kind of front end work just here in Colab by talking with the Python kernel via JavaScript and doing some HTML stuff. But for this, I chose this project specifically because I'm using 100% native Python to render this. And so just as an example, we can, you know, add something here. I'm going to save this as a Bay Piggies demo. Uh, oh, I guess I already did, did that when I was testing. So Bay Piggies demo two. Now, if I come down here, because I am talking to this shared drive folder, me and anyone else who is talking to this folder can look at that additional setting. I can refresh and then load uh, this Bay Piggies demo setting here. And you can see right here that this, we set this MN to 3.99. Um, you don't need to know what that is, but it's just an example of how we're talking to a Google Drive folder and it's just, it's working. And again, I'm not, I'm not gonna run this. There's just more examples of different widgets that you can use. Um, yeah, again, 100% native Python here. We have a couple more questions coming in. Um, uh, Vic, it uh, looks like you've raised your hand. We're gonna turn the mic over to you in just a few moments if you want, or if you'll just put something in Q&A, it'll make it easier. Uh, it looks like his hand's down, so that's fine. Two questions then. Tony's yep. asking, um, 
Are you using Pi Widgets or a custom Google version of widgets? I am using iPy Widgets. Yeah, the same that you can look up the documentation for Jupyter. It's the same library, and it comes with Colab. There are specific uh, Colab widgets that you can also use. Um, it's a bit uh, less fully featured, but easier to get up and running. Like, for example, this is all native Colab stuff. There, it parses this little param string, and it allows me to just put a form in here. And similarly, um, I'm going to move the zoom thing. If we go over here, form, we can add a form field. Uh, you know, it can be a, a Boolean. And then there's our variable name that we just added right here. Uh, so there are, go ahead. Yeah, and two more questions. Uh, Jennifer's, oh, sorry, did you finish that question first? Was there more you want to add to that one? No, I, I think I'm good, yeah. So another question is, uh, these, uh, these are plot ranges, right? It's a little bit earlier we were asking if that was a plot ranges. Plot range, can you be more specific? Uh, it was a little bit ago. Jennifer, I'll let you ask this one again in just a few moments. Um, Tony's asking, uh, will your notebooks be available after the presentation and will they run in Anaconda or only CoLab? They, I, that's a good question. They will definitely run in CoLab. However, the specifically I'm loading some data that will not be available. Uh, but my, my code is live. You can look at the notebook. You can kind of look at examples on how I import data, for example. And I mean, the UI cell is definitely available. If you double click on this, you can look at this is all kind of the UI code. I am importing some, some of my own plotting library that I wrote that's also available in this repo. And I can, I can link to the repo uh, if people are interested. Uh, the plotting is just done in matplotlib. Uh, no Altair or anything fancy, so. And to follow up on that question for a few moments ago, we were just looking at the volume toggles. We're not quite sure how to describe that and trying to follow along, but uh, yep. we would like that link to your original repo. That would be great as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I can, you can talk to me and send me an email or something, and I can give you some examples if you want, or we can go from there. And instead of, at the very end of your talk, instead of just reading them out, we'll actually turn the mic over to people to ask more directly on questions too. Sure, yeah. I mean, we can just go straight into questions because I'm kind of at my, I'm a little past my limit here, so. Oh, sure. Jennifer, do you want to ask some questions directly? Oh, hi, Nathan. This is Jennifer. Um, hi. So I, hi I, I have tons of questions, but I also <laughs> I could probably do a little bit of catch up on my own before I asked more. <laughs> no problem. So I'd probably like to just sort of plug, plug through a little bit and then probably thank you for the offer to contact you with questions. Yeah, sure. I'm a geochemist, so i um, very interested. <laughs> oh, this is a geochemistry. This is, pro <laughs> this is a interesting project for you, I guess. Yeah, so cool. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any of the live questions? I have one more for Dave uh, that we're going to read out at the very end, but is there any more live questions that we have before we get there? All right, um, so for Dave's asking, at the end of your talk, uh, we're gonna ask you to, to basically say, you know, with the Google Doc, you can make this uh, document public and share it with anyone with a URL. And if it's possible, do that with a Jupyter Notebook and Colab, that sounds great. Uh, in other words, create a URL that launches Colab and basically when someone clicks on it, they don't need a, user's, a Google account to run the notebook, assuming the user doesn't want to save anything. Yes, yeah, when you share the notebook via just the share button up here, uh, very similar to Google Drive. Uh, there's, you know, you have to make sure the permissions are all set, but it's, yeah, it's exactly the same uh, as sharing a Google Doc or Google Sheets. And one more question for you. How many editors are at a time? How many editors at a time? That is a good question. I don't know. I've never, it does, when you live edit code together and you're running outputs, it does get a little messy. And you tend to get, you know, copy of this notebook, copy of this notebook, which is why when that happens, when you get enough editors, saving in GitHub is, um, it's going to be a lot less of a headache uh, for sure. And you want to make sure that's one last thing before I go here. If you are using uh, GitHub, 
you want to go down to edit and clear all outputs here because the output cells that are rendered are going to be HTML and JavaScript that is going to just collude, you know, the, the GitHub file. Uh, so, yeah, any more, any more questions, uh, Glenn? Uh, no, the, it looks like there's some chat and we'll go ahead and post these in chat as well. It looks like there's a link that's being, that Nilesh is pasting to Jennifer now. So I'll paste those over in chat for you. I don't, unless there's any more questions or any more raised hands. I don't see any raised hands. I don't see any more questions. Cool. All right. Well, thanks for, sorry, we went a couple minutes over. Um, thanks everyone for listening. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you guys so much for being here. Um, I really appreciate it. It's great to see uh, so many friends and colleagues uh, as well. And hopefully I'll be highlighting a little bit of their work and they can keep me honest about who did what. Um, but, uh, you know, I got, a, uh, I got into uh, this topic and this area of interest um, because I started my career uh, in data analytics. Um, and then, you know, got my first job programming full time in the, you know, in the DevOps realm. Um, and that's, I think that explains sort of why I've been able to, or been so interested in moving the things that I've seen in the data science, data analytics world um, into uh, a sort of operations. Um, and that's what I'll be talking about today. Um, so uh, just quickly, um, here's my contact information. Um, and me because it's easier to put a photo up than to show video. Um, so feel free to reach out after this uh, if you want to chat about anything. Um, all right, so. Paul, yes. before you start, would you like me to wait, hold questions until the very end or interrupt and ask as we go? Um, whatever is fine. Okay. Uh, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't matter to me. Okay, so uh, basically the general conceit of this, well, let me lay out some general assumptions about this talk, right? So. People that are in technical operations, the people that are referred to as DevOps, QA automation, InfoSec, et cetera, their day-to-day -day has been very much transformed uh, as a result of using software automation and programming. So when I started uh, in the software industry, we had things called systems administrators. Um, you know, now, nowadays, uh, you, call yourself a, you call yourself a DevOps engineer, you pick up some Python programming skills, and you charge your employers three times as much. Um, and I'm only being somewhat flippant, um, but the, the point being that I, I think there's, there's been a massive in, increase in terms of the sophistication, the scale that uh, people in technical operations um, are able to do their jobs. But one of the challenges is that if you take some of the normal tools that have made software engineers more productive and you apply them to the problems that we run into in operations, uh, they fall flat. And I've listed some examples here. Um, one of the big parts of this is that the problems that we deal with, or at least in, in my experience uh, we've dealt with, are very diverse. They're often quite novel. Oftentimes they are trying to figure out a very specific problem about a very specific system when you have no idea how that system works. Um, and that looks a lot different than trying to bang out uh, you know, another incremental feature, right? So um, I really like the exploratory programming paradigm, which is exemplified by Jupyter Notebooks and the entire ecosystem that embraces a lot of the challenges that are inherent to the operations world. It's also very interesting, I think, that Jupyter really hasn't seen an exploratory program, I mean, by extension, hasn't seen a ton of adoption outside of a very small area. So in my estimation, this is one of those cases where the future is already here and it's not evenly distributed. Um, and I threw that in there only partially because I'm a Gibson fanboy. Okay. So when I talk about exploratory programming, um, this is a quote from Jeremy Howard. Uh, I'll be highlighting some of his work with MB Dev later, but it's basically the, the acceptance that most of us spend our time as coders exploring and experimenting. Um, that's, that's kind of the world, at least that I and a lot of my colleagues live in. And, and again, the, the main conceit here in this talk is exploratory programming fits the operations model Therefore, we should use the tools from exploratory programming and bring them in because they already exist. Okay, so the caveat here, um, Moshe Zadka uh, was, he's been extraordinarily generous with his time and reviewing a lot of this stuff. He's the one that encouraged me to give this talk. Um, these were his words of warning that a talk like this is gonna be like convincing people to use Emacs. 
um, which I thought was a riot. Um, but it's also true. One of the challenges with Jupyter Notebooks and explaining them to people that live in this operations world is that you have to understand the breadth of what the tool and the entire ecosystem does in order to understand how you're going to be able to apply it and make it useful for you. Right? It's not one of those things, at least in my estimation, that you're going to be able to go grab a tutorial, see, the, you know, see how this thing is going to work. Great, either I'm going to use it or I'm not. So the request that I have of you, uh, channeling Moshe, is that you take a ride with me, go look at the tutorials later. I've tried to structure this talk as a result, and again, his recommendation, um, and many thanks to him uh, if he's on, um, is that I show some demonstrations of the power here and then we can kind of back into how the sausage is made later. And again, I've given you my contact information. I'll send out the slides um, and uh, the code. And uh, also I've got a video uh, I can post that I pre-recorded in case you want to listen to me do this like at half speed and, and you think me stuttering and stuff is funny at that speed, which I guess it kind of is. All right, so moving forward, what's my conceptual view of Jupiter as it pertains to the operations engineer? So to me, Jupiter is a mashup of a shell, a REPL, and an IDE. I usually use it somewhere in between running like an individual shell command and when I'm trying to build or manipulate some sort of feature in like a normal software engineering scalable way, right? So in those sorts of cases, I'm going to grab a normal IDE. Uh, I threw in a bullet point that was a joke because I was told that jokes uh, are good in talks. Uh, I wanted to tick that box. Um, and finally, uh, and I think this is one of the most important things um, that's really kept me going with Jupyter, um, is uh, uh, it serves as executable documentation. I was a really big fan of BDD that came out of ThoughtWorks, all of the cucumber testing, um, those sort of ideas that came out in the 2010-2011 case, where there was a real emphasis on working with business analysts, trying to develop a, a shared language um, where when you were developing a product and then also using um, uh, very explicit uh, examples in order to define systems behavior. I think there's a real opportunity with Jupyter to be able to do that and also not fall prey to many of the downsides that made uh, Cucumber, if you ever used it, a massive pain in the ass. Okay, with me, uh, he showed you a lot of the mechanics. Um, but I just want to give you enough, again, kind of in the spirit of this talk, uh, to be able to show you how I'm working things kind of behind the scenes. Uh, I mean, with that, I'm gonna switch over to my Jupyter Notebook. Uh, I put a link, excuse me, I put a link up here to uh, all the code or almost all the code in the talk um, and I'll put the rest of it in. All right, so minimal mechanics. You have a choice basically to get into the kind of the Repli thing, you're inserting code into cells and executing it and you see the output below it. You have a choice of using a code cell or a markdown cell which you can do here. Obviously, this one's a markdown cell. I put the code into the cell and I hit shift enter in order to execute it. I can use arrow keys to move between the cells. I can also use the enter key or the up down arrow keys to move around within the cell, right? So I can hop between cells and we'll see some of the upsides and the, you know, the, the, the ultimate deltas of doing that um, in a little bit. Okay, so I promised you uh, a talk that was gonna focus more on demos. There's some things uh, about the underlying Jupyter internals I wanna share with you. Let's do it in the form of demos and hopefully in terms of things that you might care about. Here's a list of those things very briefly. It's gonna run on a kernel. It can be multiple languages. Typically it's IPython. You're gonna run this as the user that launches the Jupyter Notebook, meaning it has access to everything that your user has access to. The GUI, um, the notebook itself is running in the browser. That means you can hack it. Um, it means that you can, and I'll show you later, you can run the kernel on a different system, kind of like what we saw with Colab. Um, and finally, it's gonna store the state of what you're doing um, in JSON. So at the core of all of this is JSON. Um, and there's some implications there too. Um, very quickly, uh, I showed you a Repli example. Um, I'm running this all from a virtual environment, again, running as my user. Um, it allows you to do some IDE features. Um, so in this case, uh, I'm using autocomplete. Uh, I just wanted to show that uh, quite briefly. Um, move to the bottom, there we go. Um, I can show you now uh, another example. This is a debugger that's available actually in Jupyter Lab, which is the uh, successor, I'd say uh, a very, very um, 
disappointing successor to Jupyter. I just use the notebooks for a variety of reasons. Um, but you can see in this case that um, you can do the, the kind of things that you would do with a normal debugger in terms of setting breakpoints, looking at the call stack, et cetera. Um, so there's some really cool IDE-like features, as I mentioned. Uh, sweet, okay. So uh, if you want to follow along at home, I've put the links into all of these as well as titles. Hopefully these, uh, uh, hopefully I've cleaned these slides up enough that this is uh, useful. Um, so here is uh, notebooks are multilingual and multi-purpose. So I'm going to skip through some of this because, uh, or go quickly through some of this rather, um, because um, uh, Nate actually covered a lot of this in a really interesting way. Um, you know, uh, I'm running this in Python. I'm going to hit shift enter. Sweet. Um, I can make the entire cell into bash using what's called a magic method. Those are the dual modulos there. I think about that as being a decorator for the entire cell, right? So in a case like this, I can run my echo directly in here. As Nate pointed out, if I use this bang syntax, it's actually going to subprocess out and run um, this uh, command um, uh, in the shell. Um, he showed some examples too of this. I really like being able to do mixing and matching um, between uh, the different languages. Um, I'm much more comfortable in Python, even though I spend a lot of time with Linux. Um, so I do the mixing and matching, oftentimes based around the um, syntax of the tool I'm working with where I'm more comfortable. So in this example here, um, I'm outputting uh, the dig here and then using Python syntax to extract out the IP uh, address that I want. Uh, I find that I, I grab this a lot of times when I would be doing um, complex if case statements, stuff like that, um, uh, for loops that get kind of messy uh, or where I can use uh, list comprehensions um, or, you know, and, and where I used to use bash very poorly or I would use a here doc, I can talk to you at end about why here docs blow. Um, they're pretty awful, um, but they get the job done. The other thing I, I found that was really useful is that you can use this underscore syntax where you can manipulate the output of the previous cell in the next cell. So you can see I'm printing out the, uh, that there. Um, here's a, just a quick example. And again, it's covering some of the stuff that Nate did, um, but basically uh, I can do things like, you know, grab my token. I can string interpolate it in with this, um, um, uh, with this curly brace. Um, and I can do things, as I mentioned, I'm more comfortable, for example, using the raw get syntax on the command line than I am importing a package for it and figuring out all of what's going on there. Um, so if, let's say I'm, in this case, I'm iterating through and uh, pulling down these repositories locally so I can manipulate them, um, I'm gonna use a for loop where I just uh, uh, subprocess out to run these sorts of things. And you can see I'm using the string interpolation in this here. So one other great example here, and we'll get into this a little bit more in terms of the flexibility that provides for what I, uh, what I term um, progressive automation. Um, you can see that uh, uh, initially I would do a git clone here, right? I can just comment the git clone out and add git pull. And suddenly this becomes, you know, yes, a hacky version of the stuff that I was doing, but I think a, a much better uh, artifact uh, that reflects the work that I actually did to accomplish whatever it was than it would have if it just was lying around in my bash history. Okay, um, you know, uh, here's one really quick thing. Um, you know, uh, Colab takes advantage of this. This is something I picked up from the high-performance computing industry, or uh, um, you can run uh, the kernel on a different machine than you run um, the uh, notebook itself. So really all you're doing, you're starting the kernel up on your remote host, you start up an SSH tunnel and you port forward back. Um, this is really useful. We used to quite a bit at Adapar. Um, I think Mike Lenick and Matt Reed may be on the phone here. Um, but we use it uh, to allow data analysts to uh, manipulate uh, data sets that they shouldn't have access to on their local uh, endpoints. Um, uh, we, used, we use this to mediate uh, their ability to work with those, uh, work with those assets. Um, also, to uh, um, we were using uh, Jupyter Hub in this case, which is very similar to Colab, um, but we could effectively mount a, um, a, 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 a volume on the Docker uh, on the Docker container that spun up for each user, um, and we would know as a result of who that user was when they uh, authenticated to us. Um, we would know what kind of access they were allowed to have by hitting an access control server, and then we could make secrets that. Uh, we can make secrets available to them um, 
there. Uh, and then they could get the kind of access they needed, again, never having to have those secrets uh, located on their uh, home machines, um, on their laptops. So we thought that was pretty cool and I can talk about that uh, a little bit more. Okay, we're gonna talk about hacking your notebook, right? This is just a web page, right? Just a web page. Uh, we'll get into uh, an example that I think is much more sophisticated. Um, but right now, I just want to show you that uh, all this is, again, is a web page. So I can run uh, arbitrary JavaScript and manipulate what's going on in here. And again, I'll, I'll do something a little bit more dramatic with this later. Um, but to, just to give you a sense of what one might do, um, you know, I can programmatically grab individual cells. I'm going to grab this hello cell here. And you see I'm doing this in the uh, uh, developer console. Um, but I can also use this, you know, again, I've done a lot of things where I've, I've uh, uh, hidden cells, I've moved output around, I've used output and interpolated into a string in a different cell, something like that. Here's a little snippet that I threw in here, um, partially just so I could show off this JavaScript magic method, um, which is going to make this whole thing run with JavaScript. I could either run it, you know, here, uh, or I could run it in the console. Uh, in this case, um, you can see all of the methods that are in place on this cell object, um, which can be really useful to figure out how uh, you want to hack things. Um, so uh, again, I'll show you a, a more uh, substantial example later of how you can mess with the browser and do cool things. Um, but hopefully that's a, a, that's a little bit of, of hacky goodness. All right, so JSON is Jupiter's soft chewy center. Um, this has a number of implications. Let me show you, um, just so you, you get a sense, um, where did this guy go? Uh, there we go. This is the minimal mechanics uh, notebook that we're just seeing as raw text. So you can see it's fairly easy to make sense of what's going on here. Oh, look, this is a cell type of markdown. Here's the source that went into it. Um, you can see the execution count um, on cells that have been run. Um, you can see some additional metadata that's present here. Um, and and um, excuse me, this can do some really awesome stuff. I'll talk about some of the downsides later, um, but one of the things that, we, that I've done with uh, consulting clients um, has been to create runbooks. I'll show you an example right next, um, where uh, a, a user can um, work through a runbook, they can uh, save it, they can attach it to a ticket. Uh, if they wanna hand it off, for example, to the next person who's on call, they can email it to someone, um, they can, um, they can send it to someone who can help them troubleshoot you know, what's going on. Um, I've had some uh, colleagues develop a set of tools that sit within uh, an implementation of Jupyter. I'll show you uh, uh, kind of what that implementation looked like. Um, but basically, you can uh, set up a, a Docker container that's run locally using a command like dot slash launch. The IPython kernel gets run. It runs the, uh, it runs the, the notebook and, and opens it up in a browser. Um, but but uh, since you're kind of a man in the middle at that point, you can do diagnostics around what someone is doing in a way that you can't by like, I guess outside of having a key logger and looking at what they're doing um, in the shell. Um, and you can do some really interesting stuff in terms of helping people um, uh, or, or looking for automation opportunities, for example. Um, the other thing that's really neat here, uh, uh, just generally relative to, you know, passing around um, uh, 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 you know, passing around code or passing around uh, um, copy and pasted stuff out of your bash history is that you can provide for, you know, a set of helpers that you can reuse across the suite of notebooks. And that creates something that is much more living. It looks like this executable documentation that the Cucumber folks really, really wanted. And that's what's coming up next. Awesome. So hopefully that's been an introduction to some of the pillars of what Jupyter is. Now let's get into some, uh, I think, more hopefully more interesting things about what this can do um, with a nod. So was that a pause for questions? Uh, sure, it can be a pause for questions. Uh, well, a couple of them I was going to read at the end. So uh, just a, 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 I'll just tell a quick one. Uh, it looks like uh, Jupiter is spelled intentionally the way it was because it was originally Julia, Python, and R. Uh, and someone wanted to point that out. I saw a pause, but I think it was my internet connection. So I'll hold the next questions till later. Okay, sounds great. All right. Um, so I'm trying to group the rest of these. And again, I, I, I somewhat apologize for this being kind of a, an, a, a, an unusual format for a talk just to show a lot of sort of disjointed demos. But uh, hopefully this gives you some ideas of what you can do with this. And you know, Lord knows, maybe I can tie this together at the end. I mentioned the term progressive automation. Um, this is something that 
is, I think, incredibly interesting. Um, and to me, it means two different things. And I'm going to set, uh, uh, I will set this runbook example up in a second. Um, the first one is the idea that uh, unlike if you're, you know, unlike in a lot of the, uh, um, uh, let's call them full automation scripts um, or CLI tools, you have an opportunity with a run book or with, excuse me, with a Jupyter notebook to let people pause and examine the state of a system that they're manipulating, right? And that can be incredibly valuable if you want someone to take the time to think about whether before they take the next step, the system is doing what they want the system to be doing. It's a great opportunity for people not to clobber things that they ought not to clobber. Um, and so this can be used, I think, in a very interesting way, um, both to provide safety to a system but also to democratize a lot of things that may have had really sharp edges otherwise. You can also, uh, as you'll see with some of these runbook examples, you can insert documentation that gives context to what a person might be doing in the next step, which I think is extremely powerful. So this idea, uh, first idea with progressive automation, that you can step your way through a set of things that are automated, but you have a chance for the operator kind of to, to get in and abort if something has gone horribly wrong. The second, uh, the second uh, progressive automation uh, 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 concept, I am, I am lacking the vocabulary to describe this now, um, but the, uh, um, the, the, the second thing here, bleh, not very eloquent, the second thing here is that you can, um, you can take manual steps or human in the middle, or, uh, uh, or human in the loop rather, steps, um, and you can uh, progressively automate the bits and pieces in something um, as you figure out how to do them. So you get the advantages of automation and automating the low hanging fruit um, while you're laying out the overall and documenting the overall process that you might be taking. And that's incredibly valuable um, for a variety of reasons. And hopefully I can explain that. Um, let's take a look. Oh, we're gonna do the stateful runbook one first. All right, so put yourself in the shoes of, um, um, an onboarding or offboarding automation runbook, right? Um, rather than having this show up in uh, something like uh, um, Confluence or another wiki, uh, in this case, you've got this living executable documentation. Basically, uh, when I did this for clients, I'd say make a copy of the notebook. Um, you fill in the metadata that you want about the individual who's being onboarded. You can manually fill in anything else that you wanted. You can skip items by setting them to true or deleting them, et cetera. And again, I've pointed out here that I've left the guts of the system open. I'll show another example later where I push that back behind the scenes, but I want you to get a sense of what actually is being manipulated here and really how trivial this is to set up. Okay, so in this onboarding thing, I've got the state of the onboarding progress here and I've got the documentation links that I'm gonna send people to to complete this onboarding. Um, I've got a simple class here. It has a status method, so you can check in with how much progress you've gone through. It allows you to complete a step. It allows you to skip and go to the next step. Once you've gotten to a point where, um, you know, where you've gotten all of the steps done, great, you're finished. Um, I did not implement this here, um, but uh, I implemented it. I've implemented this a number of times. Um, where you can file a ticket um, within the actual notebook to JIRA or send it to a Slack message or something like that. So you don't actually have to break your stride while you're going through these things, okay? So let's say I execute this thing. Um, I get this randomly selected system one. You should be onboarding. Hey, click this to go, you know, to, to follow this link. It's gonna open another tab. Um, and it says you'll need to request access if you don't have it. You can see an example of me checking status me skipping and going to the next item, um, and then me completing this, right? And when this thing is done, uh, what I did with this individual client was say, hey, just save this and attach it to a ticket to show that you've completed your onboarding. Um, in terms of progressive automation, you can see, for example, this, this, uh, um, this pattern that I, man I mentioned, I can check in on the status of the progress here. Again, I can save this part way through too. So if I get stuck, if I don't know what I'm doing, I can save this, I can send this to uh, one of my pals who can kind of help me through. Um, the other, the other, um, the other uh, 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 way of talking about progressive automation, again, vocabulary is failing me right now, um, is you can imagine a case like this, um, that for example, use this job, maybe you set up uh, uh, an API call 
or you set something up that automatically files a JIRA ticket for you or something else like this. But as you're kind of going through this uh, set of steps, you can, you can break off little pieces that are easy to automate or maybe really worthwhile to automate. Um, when I first got started in the operations world, I was a much stronger Python programmer, um, which is kind of funny uh, to think about now, but I was a stronger Python programmer than I was a systems administrator type. Um, but I worked with some of my colleagues um, uh, very closely where they would do documentation like this of a run book and I could break off little bits and pieces and automate them and I felt like I was actually adding value. Um, and that was really, really important. Um, and I'm very, very grateful for them for, for making an opportunity like that. Um, okay, uh, I'll show you another run book example. You can see some of this living documentation or intelligent documentation that took place here. Um, so I included that on that slide as well. Uh, excuse me, I included the example that I had on the slide. So if you decided you wanna go back to it later and check it out, awesome, it's all been categorized. Um, you're welcome. Uh, anyway, uh, let me show you, uh, let me show you an installation example. Um, and this again, uh, uses some progressive documentation. Um, you know, some of my colleagues uh, from, uh, from yesteryear may remember this. Um, uh, I got really annoyed with, uh, with someone uh, grandstanding and producing like a 17 page document on how you were supposed to uh, install Minikube and then being really upset at other colleagues because they couldn't figure it out or they got lost, right? So they did this in Atlassian, hence the, um, the image, which gives me a chuckle every time I see it. Um, so basically I mentioned that the setup here is someone is trying to install Minikube. Um, and so I wrote this example to highlight some of the things that you can do with uh, an intelligent uh, run book that also, uh, also I think demonstrates some of this um, sort of in situ documentation. Um, so the first step, there were a whole bunch of instructions, including sending someone to another like 17 page long instruction set on how to install Docker. And I thought, hey, most of the developers that we work with have installed Docker. We can use uh, commands like this to figure out whether this person has Docker or not. If they don't have Docker, maybe we should tell them that they need to install Docker by going to this link. If they do have Docker, don't show them that documentation at all, right? Um, particularly because this documentation, like basically everything that gets codified, rots. Um, and so I wanted to, to make sure that we were minimizing the amount of stuff in this documentation and showing people what they needed. Okay, On a, in a similar vein, um, you don't need to tell people how to install things that are on operating systems that they don't use. Um, so here is some code that helps figure out what operating system that they're using. Um, and it tells you, um, you know, the, the instructions here. Um, if Clint Edwards is on the call, uh, I wanted to highlight this, uh, very much inspired by him. Um, it's, yeah, um, thanks buddy. Um, I am gonna skip over this, but I also did some things that involved using IPython widgets. I think Nate did a really great job, far better than I would do here, at demonstrating the power of building a GUI um, uh, within, uh, within this web page. Um, all right. Uh, next step. I'm going to talk a little bit about co-developing tools and products um, with domain experts or non-technical users. Um, it's really cool to be able to, to share a talk like this after what we saw from Nate. Um, I think he really uh, demonstrated in a great way the kind of power that Jupyter and Colab as an, a, a, a part of the Jupyter ecosystem um, has in terms of engaging people that are maybe a little bit iffier on coding. Um, one of the things that I think we need to do a better job as a community doing is giving people a good reason to learn Python, a good reason to start coding, to see the value of what these sorts of things bring, but also to work with these sorts of people as peers, right? If you're a domain expert, and you're not somehow worse than me because I code, right? And this has been in my estimation, and I think the estimation of a number of my colleagues, um, a, a great way to engage folks and show the power of, of programming. Okay, so here's a, 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 an example uh, I gave as part of a consulting pitch back in the day. I called this uh, product manager API testing. And the idea here is that I was working with a product team that was, uh, they were very technical, they were not programmers, right? And they were working on an SDK that was intended for a Python SDK um, that was intended for consumers like themselves. Um, and they were really struggling to think about how to clearly communicate uh, the, the needs of 
the uh, users represented by them to the backend team that were writing in Python. And so I built something like this. Uh, I made up a representative open source library slash API called Snarf. Uh, Snarf is awesome, by the way. Um, basically, all it does um, is uh, check to see if someone is a Snarfer, and if they are, it returns the Snarfer's email address. Uh, I don't. I, I'm sure I was sleep deprived when I came up with this. I guarantee it. Um, anyway, I wanted to demonstrate here that you could, in this example, you could show. Um, you know, you could write out in plain English the same way you would kind of in a BDD style setup. You write in plain English what's going on here. You could provide the helpful supporting links um, as well as some other things that you could do here. Um, but also uh, that you could uh, dynamically inject the status of the various tests that were in this file, right, or in this notebook. That this became um, kind of like with the runbook example, an opportunity to look at the progress of a project um, by setting, uh, uh, let's call them very clear outcomes based on uh, executable documentation that did or didn't pass with um, clear explicit example inputs um, and, 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 and def well-defined um, outputs that we expected or well-defined goals. And then we could use that to determine how far along as a, uh, uh, the project was. Um, so uh, uh, this, was, this was kind of fun. So, um, in this case here, uh, you can see I've, instead of having the code um, in the notebook itself, I've hidden it behind the scenes. Um, I'm actually just uh, running it um, out of this uh, notebook test demo. Um, but it's hidden, it's behind the scenes. There's, it's not verbose um, like it was in the other example. And you can see here's a simple example of the use uh, of this SNARF API. Okay, so example one, oh wow, example one and example one, that's, uh, that's embarrassing. Uh, it's almost unprofessional, huh? Um, I, yeah, I'm glad I got this deal. Uh, example one, so you could show that SNARF is supposed to be case sensitive. So in a case like this, um, you can demonstrate, and again, you can see this uh, underscore, um, I threw in there, I guess, to be clever. You can demonstrate um, that if no email is found, you should print test failure. Um, in a, in a, in, uh, later on, when we migrated this uh, actually to, to CICD, uh, we turned this into a set of notebooks that we parameterized using paper mill, um, which is a, a, a cool piece of tech. Um, we uh, uh, basically at the end, um, we uh, uh, collected all of the test failures so we could have an overall set of reporting about how far along the different projects were. Um, that's what we would do here. I didn't do it in this example. Um, but you could see, oh great, this is a test failure. Uh, example two, this is a little bit more sophisticated. Um, and you know, I wanted to demonstrate that you could impose a schema with JSON schema, um, and then you could set up uh, test data here, um, and then validate whether that test data actually uh, um, uh, 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 worked under that schema. Uh, again, very eloquent tonight. Uh, I apologize, um, and that it failed the way that you expected it to. Um, so this this wound up being really useful for this individual client and team. Um, and finally, I thought this was a particularly good example for um, uh, grabbing people that were non-technical, um, but, but still had a sense of how statistics works. Um, I helped these guys make performance tests. So uh, uh, I used this uh, very nice uh, time it uh, magic method um, where uh, I could have them run, again. in this case, it's against a pretend slow endpoint, um, but I could have them run uh, multiple different runs against this API. Um, and get uh, uh, some sort of output here. And then you could define a threshold um, and decide whether this thing has passed or failed based on some sort of logic. In this case, saying the best case had to be, you know, better than this, this threshold. Um, but actually with these clients, they were super happy because they were, uh, the, I think this person was a physicist who actually owned this product. Um, they were able to play with this and figure out what they actually wanted their um, they wanted their product to behave like, and they could have a great conversation with the developers about the trade-offs in terms of having something that, would, something that was performant versus reliable versus on time or whatever else. Um, so that was a really cool uh, a way of introducing something in a clean way, and I think it reads nicely in Python too. Um, so uh, I mentioned pushing state back behind the API. Uh, I'm gonna show you something that's a little bit more uh, uh, significant here, um, and it's gonna involve some more browser hacking. Okay, um, and this, this came from my, uh, let's see, I'm gonna actually, I wasn't able to figure out how to do this properly, um, so I'm gonna have to stop this guy um, and run it in a different notebook. Um, but you can see a little bit of how uh, this was set up. Um, so, uh, whoops. 
So uh, this is something uh, Matt Reed, uh, my business partner, colleague, and friend for a long time, uh, he did a lot of this work. The stuff that he didn't do was very much um, inspired by slash thieved from him. Uh, so many thanks to him for this. Um, hopefully this is something um, we can get out in open source. Um, but uh, anyway, this is that pattern I described where I say dot slash launch. Um, it's going to uh, pull down, um, uh, well here you can see it. It's gonna pull down uh, a notebook. It's going to uh, run the kernel inside a Docker container and then it's gonna run um, the, uh, it's gonna, gonna load the notebook up in the browser. Um, and that's pretty neat, right? Uh, you, let's see. Um, here we go. Uh, okay, so remember the snarf example that I had? Um, you can see here that I've done uh, a couple of different things to style it differently. Let's compare it to uh, this. Of course, this has failed, but you can see there's a very different uh, uh, set of styling. There's a Jupyter. Um, icon here, you can see there's a toolbar. Um, we've actually stripped that out. Um, we've stripped out the favicon, which you can see here. Um, so look at this nice new thing. This is all clean. You can see there are actually different items here. Um, and later on, you'll see an example where we've actually hacked uh, things to look a little bit more like CoLab, um, which we thought was cute. Um, so uh, uh, we're also gonna uh, look at a pattern um, that we use in a thing, something called DTLA. Um, that was the brainchild of my colleague, Mike Lennick, who's now at Apple. Um, it's something I would really love to see him give a talk on if he's listening. Um, but uh, uh, basically, uh, we developed a product where we engaged data analysts um, at Adapar. I mentioned there were some security benefits that we got out of having them work in notebooks um, where the kernel was, run, was, was hosted. Um, but also, uh, this allowed us to um, effectively use some of the extensions that uh, the Jupyter Notebook has to show people uh, the commands that they needed to run. So there was like a mapping between a plain English command to uh, some, some Python code, right? Um, and I've done a pretty, pretty god awful uh, uh, way of doing this. Um, I didn't get it working in time, so I apologize. But you imagine a snarf example like this here, let's pull up uh, this thing. Um, so uh, in order to do this, I'm gonna take a minor step back. In order to do this, we wrote um, a couple of custom scripts. They inject um, custom JavaScript and um, custom CSS uh, into specified locations. Um, you can see that this is an example here uh, of where we're setting up the menu, right? So, uh, and, and something like this, you can put in API docs, for example, as a utils dropdown. We put in things that you can use for styling to, if you're working on um, these extensions or styling a notebook to reset the CSS or restart the JavaScript. Um, and here's the example that I wanted to show you. You can have something like setup snarf that's written in plain English. Um, and then we're gonna inject into whatever cell is next in the notebook, the snippet, right? Hey, remember to run this before other commands is the comment. You get these items for instantiating the snarf object, right? Then in the next dropdown, or maybe in the same thing, um, it's a pretty pretty uh, uh, expressive uh, UI language, or uh, visual language, I guess I should say. Um, you could put the various different uh, uh, items that you wanted to, to run. For example, um, you could write something like this. Hey, you're checking the Snarfer list for name and get email. Just replace the name and you'll find what you want. You know, hit shift enter, you can go from there. So that lets you in a very dynamic way, and I think in a very clean way for someone that's excited about using a notebook as a tool to get their job done, um, to make use of this code. They're also seeing the coded examples every time that they have to use this, um, which is pretty slick. One of the things that we found was that this really tightened the iteration loop between us and the people that were on the ground using the notebooks in their day to day. Um, so in an example like this, um, Someone might come to us and say, uh, um, hey, you know, we need to parameterize this to say whether, you know, the snarfer is on some sort of whitelist first or not. It gave the people that were working in the trenches um, and working with this stuff every day um, a really clean way to engage with us as developers to tell us what they needed to get their jobs done and also to iterate with us, right? Where I could say, oh, like, oh, we're gonna add this thing called param equals whatever else. And they say, no, 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 don't call it a param, that's silly, call it this other thing. Or maybe they would even write it out for us and show us what they wanted to see. Um, and as a result of this, we saw a lot of people coming and talking to us about learning Python 
understanding that they could get out of that uh, spreadsheet hell um, where they had all these limitations and they could do things that were much more powerful. And it was just a, a really, really liberating experience. And I think a really encouraging experience for me to see people do, do stuff with this. Um, so that, 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 that's kind of kind of nifty, right? Um, oh yes, I had one more thing I wanted to show because um, I think this is totally awesome. Um, here's another, uh, well, uh, I could show you, uh, I'll put this up at some point. Um, you can actually use a spreadsheet like um, UI within, um, within uh, Jupyter um, and use that kind of status checking to do all sorts of kind of interesting, interesting stuff. Let's show you a Jupyter Forms example though. Um, this is a Matt Reed brainchild I thought was, I think is super cool. Um, we were working with another client um, of ours, a consulting client, and uh, they, they, um, they had a Python SDK that they wanted to uh, hand out to non-technical users. And they were really struggling with um, methods that had a large number of parameters, right? Uh, and they didn't want people to not write the code. They wanted to get people to engage with the Python so they could become power users of this, but they realized that they needed kind of a stepping stone to get people in, right? So we uh, set them up with that uh, entire idea of, you know, injecting things um, here. I'll, I'll show you a quick example of this. See, I've injected something there. Um, so we, we set them up with the injection of things and they said, oh, well, you know, can you do some sort of web form or something, but it exists within this kind of notebook paradigm because, you know, people that have gone through the sciences and worked with MATLAB, they're gonna, you know, they're gonna have a good feel for this. Can you set that up? What you, you generate a GUI and, or excuse me, a, a form. And then from the form, you can generate, um, excuse me, you can generate the, uh, the code that you want. So in this case, uh, Matt set something up where um, using type annotations, he would look at the type of each of the different parameters, decide what uh, UI element it maps to, and then dynamically generate the form. So in this case, um, you know, the method takes a parameter called what, I'm gonna type ASDF, uh, and you can see the what parameter is now set to the string ASDF, right? And then you could hit that and it would run. Um, the other thing I wanted to show off here is that I actually, in this case, hacked this. So it uses a play button like Collab because they couldn't use Collab and has a stop button. So that's kind of cute, right? Um, here's another example um, where they have a, a much more complex uh, form. Um, and it's gonna set things up here where, for example, you have a, a date picker, you've got a Boolean, et cetera. And he's picking out all of these individual items. You can see IPython widgets does some kind of sick stuff here, right? Um, the other thing that was kind of fun that I won't show you here um, is we actually set this up so this cell was hidden. Um, so once this ran with the method that they wanted, um, they just saw this web form and they just generated the code and ran it underneath, which I thought was a really, really sick UI. Um, but, you know, obviously I'm biased because I made it. Okay, um, I've got a, a final couple things. Uh, I mentioned in the summary that I was trying to build something I called an operations development environment or ODE. Um, that was about as grandiose and silly of an idea as it sounds. Um, I was hoping to have something that I could uh, hand out as like an open source project, um, but I really did not get it into a state that I wanted. This is definitely something I'd love to engage folks on if they're interested. But let me give you the uh, uh, general idea here um, of what I, what I was trying to do and what I am trying to do. If you're in operations, you probably are deluged by a huge amount of information, um, by uh, alerts that are getting kicked off, by access requests, JIRA tickets, um, you know, uh, 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 and they range in terms of actionability and noisiness. It's kind of a messy setup. So, you know, I've looked at this and thought, hey, well, can this look a little bit more like what happens at a SOC, at a software, excuse me, at a security operations center where they've got this big fire hose, but they have some element of prioritization to what's going on here. Um, and, and I started to see this applied more in the DevSecOps world or the SecOps world with companies like Bridge Crew um, and Octarine doing these sort of things where they try to add kind of a scoring function to the various different alerts that are coming off that's somewhat configurable, right? But I'd love to see this implemented in a more general sense. Um, so imagine you've got a case, and again, think back to that runbook example that I showed. Imagine you've got a case where you've got this flood of information, and within a notebook, you kind of run the status check, maybe you pull something off of a queue um, to work with it, and you decide how you're gonna triage it. That's the whole goal here. 
It's to triage or orchestrate the response that's happening. So one opportunity might be to run a remediation. Either you manually remediate it in place. Great, now you've got the steps that you took to, to do that remediation. That can be saved as an artifact that can be shared with, with friends, given to other people, automate, whatever else. It could be a single script. You can pull things in as a library into various other scripts. So it gives you an opportunity to have building blocks that you can build into something that's such, uh, much, much more significant. Um, it gives you a chance to implement this human in a loop type automation or this sort of full automation. Um, you know, and, and perhaps you're even just looking at the, the status of what's happened, right? Oh, the, all these other things were automated. Here's the outcome. Let me backtrack into what might have happened. Um, there's also a great opportunity. And again, I really appreciate what the folks at Bridge Crew and Octarine are doing in terms of bringing this paradigm into more of the operations world is that you're able to have some sort of um, like tenuous state where you're able to say, um, hey, you know, this thing isn't what I'd like, but I'm going to whitelist it for the time being. I'm not going to remediate it. Uh, I'm not going to say that it's fixed. So you can store like this other layer of state. And I imagine this case storing this in a notebook, right? And basically providing a bunch of helpers um, to send things to Slack, send things to Jira, to be able to look at status, to be able to run these automate, or excuse me, this, this remediation or whatever else. Um, and, you know, I see this as a, as a sort of a generalizable, a lightweight, very scalable way um, to, again, to, to try to make sense of this deluge of information in a single place, almost like having a single pane of glass that you can look to, or look through, rather. Um, so I think that there's some really, really interesting opportunities here to leverage some of the stuff that's present in Jupiter um, and in the ecosystem and the things that are inspired by the Jupiter ecosystem even to help make our lives better, again, in a more general sense. Um, and, and hopefully this has given you kind of an idea of uh, uh, some starting points or some things that might be interesting to you that we can use to build something that's much, much better for the next set of people that are getting into operations. Um, I do hate talks that, um, that uh, 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 don't talk about the downsides. Um, so I wanted to bring that up front and center. Um, why has this not replaced my terminal? Because I definitely still use the terminal. Um, and I'll show you an example of, of one of the things that I've been doing a lot more of that's using VS Code in the integrated terminal. I think there's a great opportunity, again, to kind of merge these different worlds, um, but that, that's something for a different day. Okay, biggest thing is that a lot of other people don't use it. This is still weird. I think when I talk to colleagues, um, my colleagues have been universally wonderful um, about just figuring like, oh, this guy, is, it's like he's using some sort of funky shell, uh, okay. Um, like, like he's, he's an odd duck, but all right, this is fine. But there are not lots of people that are using this like an anger on a day-to-day -day basis. Hopefully this encourages some of you to at least give it a try and kind of see where it is. Um, scalability is a pain in the butt. Um, you know, it's very difficult because everything is stored as JSON to do diffs between the two. You get um, uh, changes like the, the, the number of executions that don't really matter. Um, it's also challenging to do things like pull scripts out of a notebook. Um, and that gets to some of the stateful nature of things, right? Um, so let's take a look at the stateful nature uh, example. Oh, great. Okay, never mind. Um, oh, you know what I'm going to do? Check this out. Uh, let's take a look at how uh, GitHub renders this. It's almost like I planned this. Wow, such magic. Okay, so um, take a look at this example. Um, let's say I've run through this. Uh, I've assigned... Uh, uh, finger a value, I've assigned finger another value, and then I print finger. And I look at this and I say, what the hell? I just said finger is supposed to be 20. Well, it's because I've run this out of order, right? And you can kind of see from the execution numbers where those things have gone out of order. Um, but this is, uh, uh, this is a great place to have a really nasty gotcha. So you could imagine a case where you've run through uh, a set of automation the first time, maybe you've saved a list, um, Let's say hypothetically, because I've never done this, uh, let's say you've saved a list of S3 buckets that you wanted to delete in the past, you saved it into a notebook, and then you pick it back up, and you don't change the, uh, um, you don't change the value of the set of notebooks that you want to delete, and say you delete the wrong notebooks, or excuse me, delete the wrong buckets. That would be really bad, right? Um, the other thing I wanted to point out here, too, in terms of storing the state, is that it is definitely easier to have people um, pull uh, passwords, um, other sorts of information that shouldn't get checked in, um, 
even even if it's you know if it's hidden in cell output or in uh, uh, other sort of logging junk that may not be present or maybe hidden in the UI. It's another problem I've seen. Um, you have some extension that hides cells and accidentally you've included something that's messy. Uh, you could be checking some things into version control that you really don't want to have in version control, right? Um, I think the really, you know, those are things that I think that are going to be outgrown. Um, one of the really big problems I've had is that it, it doesn't run bash, it runs shell and you're limited in terms of the commands that you can run because you're using that bang syntax to subprocess out. I have some examples I can share with you about how you can import your aliases. Um, they're, it's really ugly. It's really, really ugly. I'm not super happy with how, how it goes. Um, uh, but finally, um, I found myself spending a lot of time using VS Code. Here's my much neglected blog. Um, but I use the VS Code integrated terminal uh, quite a bit. Um, I do a lot of the same, um, same sort of things. Um, basically documenting my work while I'm working. Um, and because I don't have to use that bang syntax, I'm not limited quite in the same way. Um, I, I find myself kind of jumping to this rather than jumping to Jupyter in a lot of cases. So the, where Jupyter to me has really shown has been uh, when I can do that mixing and matching of Bash and Python or JavaScript and Python or something else like that. Um, but uh, uh, um, you know, uh, let me show you a cute example. Let's see, which one is it? Ah, here we go. Um, so uh, uh, the reason I really like this is uh, um, as I, you know what, I'm going to show you a live example instead. Uh, live examples have not yet failed me. So uh, maybe they can fail me now. Um, so I've rigged up, um, I've rigged up the integrated terminal here to, um, um, to uh, uh, run the line that I'm on. Um, when I hit the uh, control B key. So see, I run the line that I'm on here and that works with anything that I want. So I could even just talk to, you know, talk to a Python script or something else, right? So I find that to be really valuable. What I really wish I had was some ability to do that mixing and matching, like within a Jupyter notebook, um, uh, um, but also include this ability to do the command B piece and to have this be, you know, have this have a little bit less overhead. Um, you can see within um, the uh, Jupyter, uh, excuse me, uh, within VS Code, which is my preferred editor, um, they actually have uh, very recently uh, come up with uh, a Jupyter experience that sits in here. You hit this button to run the cell. Um, I found it a massive pain in the ass to get it to work. Um, but you can see some bits and pieces here. But like in a perfect case, you could imagine, and I still can do this, right? I could hit like Command B, and I would love to be able to run, say, the output of a cell, um, like if I wanted to dynamically generate some sort of output that I could have, uh, or copy and paste the output somewhere else, that would be, I would be like a pig in mud. I would be so happy. Uh, in yeah. that same subject, it looks like Aaron just asked, do you actually copy the IPYNB files to VS Code and run them from that interface? No, I don't. Um, I run them within the Jupyter Notebook interface for the most part. Um, so when I'm doing my, um, when I'm doing my like day to day where I'm working with this stuff, that's pretty much, that's pretty much what I'm doing. Um, there are some tools. Um, I, I wanted to point out uh, paper mill lets you parameterize notebooks, but the thing that I would send you to, this is like my, my great hope for where things are going. Um, this project NBDev, it's by the fast AI guys. Um, They've developed a whole bunch of tools to try to take this exploratory programming uh, model. They're the ones that at least popularize this from my perspective, um, but to move, you know, basically to shoehorn that into typical software development tools. Um, so they've got tools that let you do diffs really nicely. Um, they've got tools that let you um, uh, develop uh, and import uh, notebooks as modules into each other or to generate PyPI packages. Um, and they also have things that let you, uh, uh, excuse me, generate a script so you don't have to deal with um, running things out of order. So I've used that in the past where, hey, I'm gonna muck around with something in a Jupyter notebook, I'm gonna get something to work. I find myself doing a lot more of that, uh, even with um, what I used to jump directly into VS Code for, but then fairly quickly, um, usually at the point where I'm trying to make, a, where I would usually make a pull request, or do a code review with someone else, I usually use MBDev and pull that out into its own standalone script. Um, 
I found that to be uh, probably the best thing. Um, I really, really love the vision that these guys have. I absolutely recommend that you read this. Um, I think that it, it um, uh, there's also, there are a whole bunch of other uh, notebook, um, uh, notebook based uh, 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 tools and setups. There's a great one and I'm forgetting the name of it in the JavaScript world um, that do some really, really cool stuff. And you saw Colab. I mean, there's a lot of great stuff that that's really pushing together. Um, and I think is going to put us in a better place as operations professionals and as Pythonistas and whatever, uh, you know, uh, whatever uh, uh, overlap there are between those two um, to be able to use this, use this more and more on a day to day. Um, and again, I'm really happy that uh, potentially, uh, excuse me, potentially I'll be able to use the, um, you know, use the notebook here or the notebook. Oftentimes I'll keep the notebook in the browser on one window and keep VS Code in, an, in another window. Um, and you can kind of switch back between the two. Um, the other place that I found has been a really natural, um, a really natural uh, uh, place to work. Oh, look, I was practicing this demo earlier. Ha ha. Um, a really natural place to work. Remember I showed you I had this uh, notebook demo test. Um, I might be working behind the scenes on a piece of Python code like this that I've intentionally hidden from a user. I'll leave that up and running um, in another window. Uh, I just moved it to another window, like you could see that, which is pretty stupid of me. Um, but you know, whatever. I, I wish you guys were in the room with me so you could see this, but you know, I I, I am alone. Um, anyway, I, I I I split those things that way, um, the same way that I would if I was developing like a a a, a web product and I'm you know mucking around with CSS or HTML. In, in that vein of organization, when do you have logic uh, in enough notebooks that you're moving functions into a Python module? That's a great question. Um, I typically, um, I know I pooped on the don't repeat yourself, the dry thing. Um, what I learned a long time ago from a guy named Grant Jenks was if you do it twice, that's the point at which you start thinking about it. The third time, you really ought to move it out. Um, though I also oftentimes, where I would generally... Where would, I, where I would have copy and pasted something into Slack or an email or into a gist, once I had that inkling that like, hey, it's time for me to do something like that, um, that's the point at which I decide this probably needs to go into utility library. Um, it feels very, very similar to me um, if you're working on a sort of a newish Python code base, you would, you know, you, the, 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 uh, my experience has been that uh, teams generally move things into libraries at about the same rate. Um, so they're, they're extracting things at about the same rate that they would if they were extracting them into a util, um, if they were doing kind of typical software development for a, a Python based product. Um, so I, I kind of use the same, the same rule in all those cases. Um, it's also nice, you saw with the drop downs, it's nice to be able to offer um, links to documentation or offer the ability to just drop that like plain English, like, you know, hey, this library does X and you can drop that directly in. Um, rather than having someone have to fart around with a bunch of, of documentation. Um, I didn't get into it too much too, but um, you know, you can run HTML and render HTML really cleanly and run JavaScript. I mean, I showed you can run JavaScript in this, but you could uh, uh, inject with one of those snippets, you could just inject like HTML that showed you like a, um, you know, an animated GIF of how something, GIF, GIF, whatever, of how something is supposed to work. So there's some really, really interesting opportunities if you were to do this at scale. Uh, by the way, it looks like a uh, great talk and uh, we will actually, Chris, if you don't mind also pasting that in the group chat for everyone, it looks like there's a way to put your Jupyter extensions as uh, run your notebooks as presentations. And there's a link that Chris will hopefully put for everybody in the chat so we can see it. Yeah, that's super cool. That's super, super cool. There's so much going on there um, in this ecosystem. There's also um, people have made entire books within Jupyter and that's a really cool way to, to, to really to illustrate that you can do um, you know, inline documentation and, and then have a whole bunch of really dynamic content. Um, yeah, let me, let me wrap real quick. Um, I see this as a means of engaging more people that don't know how to code, that want to get into operations. I think it's a great way if, if you're dealing with sort of old school systems administrators to get them to want to code, you're dealing with other people. This was like the gateway drug for a lot of people. I love this stuff. I think it makes I think it makes programming a lot more welcoming. Um, and if you're into this stuff, I would love to chat. Um, I put the contact information in the slides. Um, and finally, I've got a bunch of people I should really thank. Um, you know, uh, Grant and Moshe, 
the entire Adapar crew. Um, the folks, uh, I'm, I'm currently at Primer. There were folks on the infrastructure team that I listed here that took call for me um, so I could spend the time um, setting this thing up um, and, you know, make uh, errors. And Amy helped me with slides, which is awesome. That's a great group of people. And I really want to thank you for your kind attention for kind of a wacky slide and Bay Piggies for being a great resource. So, you know, thanks so much. Uh, I will put this code and the slides up. Um, and again, feel free to reach out to me if you have questions. I hope this really is the beginning and it gets you thinking about how you might be able to use this or kind of, you know, scrub down some rough edges uh, for people in your world. One thing with Jupyter Lab that I found, I built a magic extension to to Jupyter Notebook and they completely changed the APIs, client side yeah. APIs in Jupyter Lab. So my extension won't work and you, I have to start over from scratch if I want to implement the same thing. So yeah. Yeah, it's definitely anyway. quite disappointing. Yeah, but anyway, it is what it is, but they do great work and, you know, it's a, the, the whole thing is a great idea. Um, so I had one question I wanted to ask when I, you were presenting in one of your notebooks, you had something called Jupyter Forms. Yes. Is that an open source thing or is that, because I searched for it and I couldn't find it. Oh, uh, it, is, um, it is based on IPython notebooks, or excuse me, IPy widgets. Um, Actually, uh, one of my colleagues, who I think might be on the call, um, did most of that work. Um, I didn't feel comfortable putting it out there without getting a hold of him, um, but I'd love to make that available to more people. Um, I think, you know, uh, I know that the, um, what are they, uh, Zymergen has some cool talks where they've done some stuff like that, where they have forms and a tappable interface. Um, and I can see if I can dig that talk up too. But I'd love to see more and more of those sorts of open source contributions. Um, these days, uh, um, there also, again, there's another layer now of things. Um, oh, gosh. Oh, man. I wish Lenick were here. Um, there are two uh, stream, is it stream mill? And um, I can't believe I'm forgetting their names. Um, uh, uh, there are at least two projects that are building much more substantial UIs. Like in terms of like a drag and drop, it looks kind of like Dash uh, UIs on top of Jupyter. They're really excellent, um, really, really coming along. Um, oh, this is going to irritate the hell out of me until I figure out what it is. Um, one of them is more generally focused. Oh, Hex. Lenick got it. Lenick is here. Good job, Lenick. It's Hex. Um, they, do some, uh, they do a more generalized version of building some really substantial UI stuff. Um, I, would, I think if they're in a beta, I would absolutely recommend checking them out. Um, okay. I would love to be in a world where, like right now, when I get a UI that's of any level of substance, I wind up having to throw a Vue.js app up in front of it. I would love to not have to do that. I think Hex offers that opportunity. Um, and, you know, I like that bridging technology. I think it makes this so much more available to more people. Okay, great. Well, thanks. And if the whoever is doing the Jupyter Forms open sources, that, that would be great because I have an open source project. I'd love to use it, but um, that's awesome. Anyway, yeah. cool. But uh, thank you. Yeah, great yeah, talk. Thank, oh, thank, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it.